Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Hi, everybody. So good to see everybody. Miss you all in person. Um, that was a wonderful read. Thank you. Um, since I'm not a long time member of First Unitarian, I uh, surmised that Libby had asked me because of my uh, involvement in uh, racial equality and criminal justice. So I decided to talk about why I'm a race an, an, an activist and why I've concentrated on racial equality and criminal justice. And Patty Clark's dad worked for my dad. So uh, as Patty knows, my story is very interrelated to my father. And in order to talk about me, I have to explain who Colonel Bob Abbott was. Um, he was a World War II veteran and he was in the 1st Infantry Division which meant he was one of the first soldiers to get into the uh, European theater when the U.S. joined the war. Um, he fought in North Africa, Sicily. He was seriously injured and rehabbed in London and was reassigned as the executive officer to General Omar Bradley at the uh, D-Day London headquarters. Uh, during one of the blitzes of of London, the back end of uh, Norfolk Place was hit and caught fire. And dad and gathered a crew together, put out the fire and saved the D-Day plans. Um, there were no copiers back then. Um, and it was a big enough event that he got a bronze star for it. And almost 20 years later, um, on a Friday afternoon, uh, the phone rang in his office and he answered it, Bob Abbott here. And the voice on the other end said, Bob, this is Ike. Well, General Hugner was here in Rochester to get an honorary degree at the University of Rochester. And out of the blue, he called my dad. Uh, Dad's feet never touched the ground for a couple months. Um, and reiterated with him how important his actions were. And, that, and I said, I don't know what we would have done if we had lost the D-Day plans. Um, but anyway, Eisenhower calling my father was sort of the, the epitome of his military career. Um, after World War II, I was born. Uh, we lived a fairly normal life. Uh, Dad was um, still in the military, and he was assigned to start up the Army National Guard in Ithaca. And then in 19, June 1950, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. In July 1950, I turned four years old, and in mid-September, Dad got on an airplane and flew off to Korea, telling me to be good, take care of my mom, and that he would see us at Christmas. Um, of course, things didn't work out that way. Thanksgiving that year, uh, the Chinese entered the war, and Dad was captured. Uh, for the next two years, he was missing in action, which means we didn't know if he was dead or alive. Uh, my mom and I had moved in with her parents, my much beloved Scottish grandparents. And so I didn't have a dad. Um, my life was never normal from, from that point on. Um, however, there was a silver lining there because for three years I lived and uh, was part of the lives of my grandma, my grandpa, and my uncle Jim. And, uh, you know, you have a four, five, six-year-old following you around, it was pretty special for them and for me. Um, when dad returned, he had been a POW for 33 months. Uh, when my mom walked in my grandma's front door with my dad, the whole family was there and everybody was so excited about seeing him and all that kind of stuff. And um, that night when she put me to bed, I asked her if she was sure that that was my dad because I did not recognize him. He had changed physically so much. On the other side, he brought back gifts for everybody. And I, mom and I, of course, got very special gifts. And mine was a beautiful silk kimono for a four-year-old. And I was seven. So I ne could never wear it. So the two of us had to uh, get used to each other. And I, I have no idea how long it took. And because of my work with veterans, I know that this is a very common when uh, veterans come back from being overseas, 
there's an adjustment time. I have no idea how long. I mean, he, he had to sleep on the floor for months. He had flashbacks of malaria and the dysentery never left him. So it, plus the psychological effects of having been tortured and um, diseases and malnutrition and all that kind of stuff. So, but somehow we, we figured it all out. And from there on, uh, we were pretty much attached to the hips. Um, when he returned from Korea, he was a Lieutenant Colonel. He had been a major in World War II. Lieutenant Colonel and his awards included uh, two silver stars, three bronze stars, purple heart with four clusters, the French Croix de Guerre, and a very unusual um, medal, very uncommon, the Legion of Merit. Um, so he was Rochester's war hero and most decorated soldier. Um, the Rochester Public Library a few years ago uh, produced a double edition of the Rochester history and about my dad. If anybody wants to know more about Bob Abbott, I happen to have copies. Uh, when he came back in civilian life, 1954, he was appointed civil defense director for Monroe County. Uh, as Rock, he was one of Rochester's most sought after speakers, both on Korea and on civil defense. Um, and I was an only child, I had pulled that off. Um, so I got to go a lot of places that most kids didn't even know existed. Um, I attended um, first division reunions in New York. I went to conventions, I went to speaking engagements. Um, and because of a civil defense director, participated in the drills that we used to have back then. And as such, uh, as a eight, nine-year-old, I spent time with senators and generals, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was very comfortable at a very young age with adults. And I never really quite fit in with kids my own age. Um, uh, Ken describes me as being very serious. I had lived for three years without my dad and then he came back and we were in the middle of the cold war and i knew that if we ever were attacked uh by an a-bomb that if i survived i was supposed to stand up and take charge um so <laughs> it's not a happy go lucky kid um ken and i had known each other since seventh grade and he describes me as never tolerant of perceived injustices. And the example he likes to give is when we were in seventh grade at a junior senior high school. Um, it was first year it was open and the food in the cafeteria was unfit for human consumption. So I decided that we should have a food strike. Talked it over with my dad and he went through this first time I did any activism and he talked me through the whole thing of activism, what do you believe in, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And he got to the end and he said, and you know, you got to ask yourself if you're willing to pay the price, whatever it is. So I said, yes, for the food strike, very successful, food was much improved. However, I was in seventh grade in a junior, senior high school. And for the next six years, I was a marked student. And there were several teachers and the principal who thought I was an anarchist. Um, and I'm sure that when I walked across the stage and got my diploma, Harold Bean, the principal, was so glad to see my backside. Um, we graduated from high school in 1964, and that was a month before Rochester erupted in the riots. Dad was civil defense director. On Sunday, July 26, uh, the officials were gathered down at police headquarters and someone suggested that they use the helicopter that was found at Page Airways to get above the crowds, see where gangs were gathering so that they could get officials in and try to break things up. The goal was to end the riots on Sunday. Um, Chief Lombard was supposed to go up in the helicopter, but he refused. And so my dad said, he'd go. Uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, the helicopter flew too low, too slow, and the pilot took one hand off the controls to wave to the people on the ground. Um, you can't take your hands off the controls 
in a helicopter. Uh, the, the copter fell to the ground, crashed, burned in a rooming house on Clarissa Street. The pilot was killed on, on impact and my dad was burned, badly burned, over 50% of his body. Uh, we were told by his doctors that if he survived 30 days, he might make it. But they didn't hold out a lot of hope because he had been wounded into wars. Uh, he had been had tortured and all kinds of diseases and infections and everything in Korea, plus the psychological damage of having been a POW. And that, that weakened him. So they didn't hold a, a lot of hope. But I did. Um, I only got to be in his room once during that whole month. And the one day I was there, he was, there's a, with burns, there's an infection. Um, and with the infection can come hallucinations. And dad's hallucinations were he was, he really lived Korea. Um, and the, the day that I was allowed in, he was having a nightmare and it was just, it was, oh my gosh, it was just, it was horrible to watch. Um, I never, the whole month he was in, I never had a chance to talk to him. Um, he, he died Tuesday, August 25th. He was buried on Thursday. He was buried here in Rochester, not at Arlington, where he should have been, because I started my freshman year at Cuba College on Saturday. So I've always had to live with the fact that he's not at Arlington. Um, we got permission for me to not report to CUCA until Monday, which meant I missed freshman orientation, most of it. It was a disaster. Because I was late, I had the schedule from hell. And the dean, we asked the dean if I could cut back and take maybe only four courses so that I could get my head above water. Um, and she refused. I had to take all five. Um, that was the, a terrible, that was really terrible. <sighs> Mom and I had, we felt we had the responsibility because Rochester was still recovering from the riots and losing their most decorated soldier. We had the responsibility of uh, getting back to normal. So I went to Cuca, she went back to work. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, it turns out, retrospective, probably was a lousy idea. But here I am, and I was determined that I was going to stay at CUCA for the whole year. Um, and uh, Mike Teleska was our attorney. And I spent many, many days on the phone with Michael, crying my eyes out. Um, I'm going to stay to the end of the year, Michael, but you've got to get me out of here. Uh, he said, what do you want to do? <laughs> and I said, I've always wanted to work in Washington. And he said, okay. Now, for the four years of high school, I had always wanted to work in Washington. And my father had always said to me, you're not going into politics, period. That's the end of the discussion. You are not going to be a politician. So I went to Washington. Um, I went to Washington School for Secretaries. And um, um, since... Michael had been Barbara Conable's campaign manager in 64. There was a meeting at Barbara's um, home in Alexander and Michael took me with, with him and I went, I met Barbara, all, about, all that kind of stuff. And then when I was in Washington and I was almost finished with my course, uh, Conable's office called me and the receptionist had resigned and they wanted to know if I would like to come work for Barbara. <laughs> really? <laughs> Uh, who cares about graduation? So off I went on my political career. And I started out with the best of the best, Barbara Connell. Um, it was a, and it was like 20 years old. It was fabulous time. Uh, one of the things that Barbara did was he did a weekly interview with a politician, Jerry Ford, F. Dirksen, Mel Laird, all of them. And I went with him to do the recording. So I got to meet at 20 years old, all these um, leaders. Um, and the other thing I will tell you about Barbara is that uh, both of us were early risers 
I am not anymore. But back then I was, and we would both get to the office really early. My job was to close my eyes, open the bathroom door, and flip the light on so that all the cockroaches in the Cannon House office building would scatter. And then we left the light on all day. Um, I then opened the office up and everything else, and Barbara went in, he read the New York Times and the, the Democrat. And then he'd come out and he'd say, okay, we're going to breakfast. And we'd go downstairs to the Long Earth cafeteria and sat at this very long table with all these other Republican congressmen. And I was the little fly on the end of the table that just sat there and listened. And it was just, it was magical. Um, Barber firmly planted my feet in moral obligation and public trust. And it was no fireman to do that. Um, I will tell you one more carnival story. Um, when he was appointed Ways and Meats Committee, gifts flowed into the office from every lobbyist all across the country. Uh, we wrapped them back up, sent them all back, thank you very much, but we don't take gifts. However, the staff put our foot down and the one gift that we did always keep was Chevis Regal Scotch. We could be bought. Um, after a couple of years, the glow of Washington wore off and I got homesick and I needed to come back, my mom to my grandma. Uh, and it was 1968. And if you think back to 1968, MLK was assassinated. DC erupted in riots. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And the Democratic Convention had riots. Hubert Humphrey was the Democratic candidate to run against Richard Nixon. And in the fall of 68, the chairman of the Democratic, Monroe County Democratic Committee had lunch with the chairman of the Republican County Committee, Gordon Howe. And he told Gordon that um, the Democrats were really, really concerned that the country was sliding into anarchy. And Gordon agreed with him. Uh, they, were, they were really worried. Um, so the, the Democratic chair asked Gordon if he knew somebody that could run the uh, Humphrey headquarters. And that was me. Uh, again, I'm in my early 20s. <laughs> um, and I understood the, the, the concerns, the anarchy. They can't hear me now. I'm muted. And... Wait, no. Uh, that, um, so I, I, not only did I successfully do it, but none of the Democrats that I worked with ever figured out that I was a card-carrying Republican. Um, I ended up working for Mr. Howe as a research assistant in the Public Information Office, which meant that I sat at the administration table for legislature and committee meetings. Um, the President's office had a huge table, and if you got there early, it was a coffee table. Republicans, Democrats sat together, and everybody told tall tales, all that kind of stuff. Uh, one day, I sat next to Bill Smith, who was a lovely, lovely gentleman, from black gentleman from the inner city. And he turned to me, and he said, Ms. Abbott, was Colonel Abbott your daughter? And I, I hear your father. And I said, yes. And he started to well up in tears. And he essentially said, I tried, I tried, we tried to get to your father, we couldn't do it. The flames were too great. And, and, and he just, he was in, in tears. And you know what? I realized that not all black people had rioted. Um, and a veil started to lift from my face, my eyes. Uh, about this time, our lawsuit against Page Airways was moving forward, and we had the autopsy report on the pilot. And it came back that the pilot had alcohol in his blood at the time of the crash. Another veil got lifted. Um, pilot error had brought down the helicopter, and there were many, many black people on the ground who tried to save my dad. Mm. So back to my politics. 
1972, I was invited, see I was a card carrying Republican. Back in 1972, I was invited down to Washington DC by the committee to reelect Nixon. And I interviewed with John Mitchell, who was Nixon's uh, um, attorney general and spent some time in prison. Um, I went, I interviewed, I, they wanted me to come back, had a job for me, blah, blah, blah. And I came home and thought about it. And I called Teleska up and I said, you know, Washington doesn't have the same feel it did. I don't think I want to go back. And besides, I can't stand Nixon. So I picked up my marbles and went out to Tucson, Arizona, became a PR director at an ad agency. And then Watergate broke. So um, one day I'm on the phone with Teleska back here in, in Rochester. And I said, boy, you know, I, I, I missed a bullet here. If I had taken that job, I might be involved in Watergate. Whew. Then a few years later, after they all got out of prison, I called Michael and I said, you know, I think I missed a golden opportunity. I could have taken that job, been involved in Watergate, been convicted, gone to some nice country club federal prison, got my degree, gotten religion, wrote, written a book, and when I got out, like all the rest of the crooks, I could have gone on the honorarium lecture tour and earned some money. Um, Teleska didn't always find my feeling. Um, more politics. I got married in 1974 for the first time. And about nine months later in September, um, I was working on a Friday afternoon and the phone rang and it was the chairman of the Republican Congressional Committee in DC. I don't remember who it was, but uh, he, his uh, executive director had handed in his resignation that morning and the chair was having lunch with Bill Dwyer who was a former Republican county chairman here that I had worked with when I was working with the county. And it was eight weeks before the election. The guy was crazy, um, needing somebody to run the office and run the campaign. And I asked Bill if he knew anybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so Bill gave him my name. And my references were, of course, Connable, Frank Horton, Gordon Howe, and, and Mike Teleska. So at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he called me, told me what was going on, and asked me if I could show up in Washington on Monday um, and run the Republican Gr Congressional Committee for eight weeks. I told him, I said, you know, I, I've only been married nine months. And he said, no problem. He said, of course you're going to, RCC was located in the Congressional Hotel. Put me up at the Congressional Hotel. He said, tell your husband on his day, time off, he can come, we'll fly him down there, blah, blah, blah. It's only eight weeks. You know, we'll make it work, blah, blah, blah. Um, Steve and I talked it over, and Steve decided that he couldn't do it. Um, he couldn't have me go. <sighs> it was an opportunity I missed. Um, what followed was uh, child rearing, a divorce, and me trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. Um, I'll go back to when I was working for Gordon Howe, the uh, a group of Republicans staged a coup, and Howe was thrown out as a uh, county manager. But he had been a really fair person. You shook his hand and you knew that you had a pledge and you never had to wipe your hand on your pants to leave. Uh, I'll just say not so for the ones who ousted him. Uh, and <laughs> I think my father sat on my shoulder and yelled at me and said, I told you not to go into politics. Now get out and figure out what you're going to do. So I left politics. Uh, Steve and I joined St. Thomas Episcopal Church up the street here. And the rector immediately put me on a leadership track. Um, he encouraged me excuse me, to join the uh, Junior League of Rochester, which turned out to be invaluable. Um, since I had stayed at CUCA for a year, that's all the college I had, and it had been so important to my dad, I really needed to finish it. So I decided to go uh, 
back to college and went to apply to Empire State College, which gives credit by evaluations for uh, life experience. Well, I had had a lot of life experience. Um, so between the Junior League and all the leadership I did at St. Thomas's and all those crazy jobs I had, uh, when I started at Empire State, I had almost my associate's degree. I went on, finished my bachelor's degree, and at age 50, I went down to a Ronnie Coit secretary and showed my dad I got my uh, college diploma. Um, while I was on staff at St. Thomas's, however, uh, I started to question my religious beliefs. Uh, one year, the staff decided that for Good Friday, each member of the staff would take a station of the cross and we would do a 10, 15 minute homily on what it meant to us. I got my station, I read it, I read it again, and I probably read it several more times. And I even did some research to find, try to figure out what it was talking about. And I realized that I didn't connect. So I called Jack Bishop, the, the rector, and said, I'm going to have blue flu on Good Friday. You need to find somebody else. And I was also, when I was at St. Thomas, I was director of the church school. And I did fine on the administration. But when it came to the religion part of it, I just couldn't buy totally into it. I just had too many uh, questions. So that was the beginning of my, mm, what's this all about? Um, when I actually got a paid job, uh, I worked at the Pittsburgh Credit Union. I did collections lending and collections, I had fantastic success um, collecting, recovering assets. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, I had a 26-year-old MBA supervisor. And he thought that I should do collections the way he had learned it in MBA school. And at 50 years old, I said, no, I'm doing my way. It works, blah, blah, blah. One day, <clears throat> sorry, one day, he asked me, he said, have you always been a difficult person to supervise? And I looked at him and said, well, you know, according to General Hubner, it's genetic. Well, he didn't understand. But General Clarence Hubner had been the commanding general of the whole 1st Infantry Division. And then in peacetime, he became New York State Civil Defense Director. So for almost 30 years, General Hubner and Bob Abbott knew each other very, very well. And when I was living in, in uh, DC, several times, General Hubner would take me to the Army Navy Club for brunch. One Sunday, he would, he would reminisce. It was wonderful. I had so many stories that he told me, uh, especially about my dad. And one Sunday, he said, uh, you know, your father was probably one of the most difficult soldiers I have ever had to command. Hmm. But he went on, he said, however, if I had had an entire first division of Bob Abbott's, we would have won the war the first year. So, Peter, it apparently is an inherited trait, and I got a good dose of it. Um, I figured out at that point that maybe I should be my own boss. Um, so I found uh, financial, I became a financial advisor with American Express. Uh, at that point, my mom had convinced me to uh, go to Pittsburgh Presbyterian with her and the associate minister over there said it was the perfect match for me because I had the mind of a capitalist and the heart of a social worker. And he was absolutely right. I could just, I did wonderful things with people. It was so satisfying. It was just, it was a beautiful thing. Um, in 2004, we uh, came up on our 40th anniversary of graduating from Gates Chilite. And I went on the committee and I said I would take charge of trying to find people. A, B, C, D, hmm, Ken, Ken Buckle is a B. So I uh, sent him an email and asked for information. As I said earlier, Ken and I had known each other since seventh grade, and we dated for a year and a half in high school. 
Uh, he answered me, sent me back his information and asked me about mine. I sent mine back and every six, seven weeks, we kind of went back and forth, back and forth. And I had a, 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 a trip plan to Florida to visit clients and, and a friend. So I wrote him and I said, you know, I'm going to be in Lakeland and Tarpon Springs. Is there any chance that we could do lunch? Is that near you? And he got right back to me. Amazing. Uh, and said, absolutely. So <laughs> um, the clients I was staying with were my chaperones to be sure that he wasn't an expert. Uh, in fact, when I went to the ladies room, uh, Dave had a father son talk with Ken. <laughs> um, that night, he took me out for dinner and we watched the sunset on Tampa Bay. It was absolutely beautiful, lovely time. I was nice. I was sweet. I was charming. And he finally looked at me and said, knock it off. I know you just be you. Okay. So we figured out that, Hmm, <laughs> this is, Maybe we should have stayed together. So we talked about extensively what would have happened if we had stayed together at graduation. Well, the riots were a month later and when the helicopter crashed, Ken was already in Flint, Michigan at General Motors Institute. And what would have happened um, if he had come home and missed any time at GMI, he never would have been able to go back and his whole career would have changed. I was 18 years old, my, my life had totally fallen apart. And I was, if he hadn't come back, I don't know that I could have handled that. So we came to an agreement that um, it was probably for the best that we hadn't gotten together back then. Um, but here we were back together. It was very nice. He came up to Rochester in 2005, 2006 and did a sabbatical and he, everything was going very fine but he lived in he was a tenured professor in tampa and i had a financial planning practice and a mom in rochester so who knows what's going to happen uh then in 2006 early 2006 my mother was diagnosed with cancer we were given three to six months uh so i put my practice into transfer to a colleague because I knew that I, only child, I had total responsibility for her. And she died much, much sooner than we thought. It was a point where I could have put my, I could have pulled back on the transfer and stayed in Rochester and continued on. Or no responsibilities anymore. I could marry Ken and moved to Tampa. Uh, Tampa and Florida and I did not get along right from the beginning. But it started my activism genes blossoming. I mean, Florida was too racist, too evangelical, too Sarah Palin, too everything. I just didn't get along. We, <laughs> we were Rotarians and an example at one of the Rotary meetings, one of the Rotarians got up and did the prayer. And in the prayer, he play, prayed that the stock market would go up that day. Well, I was rose from my seat and we had a very good friend who was a Rotarian. He sat across the room from him and he eyeballed me and said, you know, calm down, Roberta, calm down. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so he came over later and he said, you know, I've got a church for you too. And he told us about the Unitarian Church in Tampa. We went and the first day we walked in, we knew we had found home. We could talk to people. We had commonality. It was, oh, it was absolutely wonderful. And my activism, I started to get involved in things and, you know, racial justice. And uh, remember Occupy uh, Wall Street? Yep, that was me. Um, it was great. It was absolutely fabulous. I started to really get my energy going. Uh, we had, um, Ken decided to retire. He had to give the um, uh, 
excuse me, the state of Florida, five years warning that he was going to retire. And he said that, uh, told me that we could go back to Rochester. Five year warning, I was packed the next day. Um, but meanwhile, every summer, I kept my house here, and every summer, we would come back up to Rochester. So the, the um, move was, was pretty easy for us. Uh, and since we had been UUs in Tampa, we came to the First Unitarian and again walked in and said, this is it, we're never going to leave. Um, we went through UU 101 with Erin Julian, and by the time we were finished, she had signed Ken up for... Uh, buy fries, and had me working on social justice, and there it began. Then in 2014, um, we were coming up on the 50th anniversary of the riots. And with that came requests for uh, newspaper interviews, it was a whole page done, um, and in appearances and film showings, Chris Christopher's, Christopher's film, so in preparation, I realized that I had to deal with what the riots had meant to me. And after the, um, the lawsuit was completed, uh, Teleska sent to my mother a four-door file cabinet stuffed with all the paperwork from Dad's trial, his military papers, Every, speeches, everything. It sat out in her garage. Nobody ever touched it. And one summer when Ken and I were home, we decided that we would go through it. And every piece of paper we had to either decide keep or toss. I mean, it was quartermaster receipts were in this. I mean, it was absolutely everything that had been in his 201 file. Um, but we ended up putting together his legacy, a lot of things that I didn't know. And we also ended up putting together a picture of the helicopter, the situation, the pilot situation, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And I realized three things. One, the pilot had alcohol in his blood. Two, the black people on the ground tried to save my dad. And three, Rochester had not changed in 50 years. We were on the brink again of having another riot. It was not the fault of the black community that the dad's helicopter crashed. It was the conditions in Rochester that had been so racially charged that they had no choice. We deserved it. And I had the feeling in 2014 that it might come again. And that's when I realized that I had a responsibility to step up and do what I could. Um, I, the turning point for me was when I was asked to join Rock X Criminal Justice Task Force and found out all the things that were going on in Rochester and was able to connect with solitary confinement. Dan had been in solitary confinement in Korea. Um, and because of his incarceration, I could sit and talk to formerly incarcerated people here. Uh, they seem to accept the fact that, well, I must have known what it was like. Um, and I, I, I got to know what was happening and was able to get in and really start to, I hope, make a difference. Um, I will say that First Unitarian, has given me a platform so that I could rise up and step forward. Um, and fighting for racial equality has now become a passion and a calling. Uh, and with that, that's my story. <laughs>